there's think about that. All of those are relevant for anybody who just yeah. lost their job or just lost their business, right? Or just lost a loved one. It's like all those skills are like, oh yeah, I could use some help finding a new, my purpose. What is my purpose for the next phase of my life? I don't want to keep doing what I've been doing. I'm not inspired or that was a negative environment or, you know, and so what is my mission and who's my team? Welcome to the Susan Sly Project, where entrepreneurs rule, startups launch, and the side hustle becomes the main hustle. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Susan Sly. So you're exhausted and you have someone yelling at you and you think, oh, I don't even have anything left in me to give. And then you know that if you don't give more, you are going to be taken out and never get another chance to be part of one of the most elite groups in the entire world. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about the Navy SEALs. My guest today is a entrepreneur and New York Times bestselling author and an author of five bestselling books. He's an underachiever, clearly. Um, he not only had a 20-year career in the Navy SEALs, he was a Navy SEAL commander. So that's right. Repeat after me, whatever language you speak in 125 five or six countries that we're in now. He is the ultimate badass. There's no question there. Um, he is also the host of the number one ranked podcast on iTunes called Unbeatable Mind. And in addition to all of this, he has helped millions and millions of people all over the world, not only with his writing, with his speaking and with his techniques, but with his relentless and repeat after me, relentless drive to really help people achieve as much as they can, no matter what. So my guest today is the one and only Mark Devine. Mark, thank you for being here. Gosh, what an intro. By the way, you're the underachiever, not me. I mean, wow. But hey, what an honor to be here, Susan. Thanks so much. Oh, my first question, just out of the gate. Yeah, let's talk about burpees for a minute. <laughs> I love okay. burpees. Probably the only one who can say that with a smile. I actually love burpees. <laughs> okay. The, so the reason that's my first question is um, you have a charity and you, you literally rallied a group of people together to do millions and millions of burpees. And um, it- 22 you know, it's, million to be exact. Yeah. 22 million. So where, where did you get that idea? Do you just wake up in the middle of the night and go, I want to torture people? Like, how did that all come to be? It does seem that way, right? I mean, I have a business that's all about torturing people called Seal Fit. So I think I just, um, I have this following of people who just like to do hard things. And, and we've learned, as you know, that hard work and confronting um, challenges builds like a certain resiliency and mental toughness. You just can't get in any other way. And when you do that routinely, it becomes fun, right? Your body and mind just start to look forward to it. And you might have a little resistance at first, but then once you get into the act of the challenge, whether it's doing, you know, uh, 300 burpees every day for a year, which is what I did, or doing 24 hours of burpees nonstop to break a world record, like it starts to, it's really, really fun. And if you do it with a team or a tribe, man, you know, all sorts of greatness happens. So that, that's kind of where that came from. We, we like to do hard things for growth, not to prove how tough we are, but, for, you know, for the growth benefits that accrue from doing hard work. The human being just absolutely thrives on doing hard work. And what I, I have a chapter in my book, The Way of the Seal, I say, bring the challenge to you. Don't wait for the challenge to come, mm. right? So if you go out and challenge yourself, then when the next crisis comes, which it will inevitably, you're prepared for it. Like it's no big deal. So back, back I'll, I'll make this short, but back to the charity. I, I, you know, at the time this sounded like a fun challenge. I was just going to do hundred burpees a day before every workout for the month of December. Now that seems ridiculously small, but back then it's like, Oh, hundred burpees nonstop. You know, that could be hard. Well, about halfway through, I was like, Oh, I'm going to up this to 200 burpees. Cause this is pretty easy. And so I did that. And then three quarters of the way through, I upped it to 300 burpees. And then comes, you know, toward like Christmas time, I'm thinking about my planning for 2022. And we were also planning for the Courage Foundation. And we were talking about how 22 vets a day on average were committing suicide. And it's just heartbreaking for me and for everyone to hear that. I was like, we got to be able to do something, you know, because the VA just wasn't really helping, maybe even hurting the situation. So I said, well, what if we suffered for the vets to raise awareness and money? 
And what better thing to do, but burpees and everybody can do burpees, right? I mean, you may not want to do burpees, but everybody can do them. So it popped in my head that maybe I would do a ton of burpees. And then I thought, well, if why just me? And let's put this out to the entire tribe. And so I thought 22, how many should we do? 22,000 each, you know? And then I said, no, let's do 22 million burpees. Because I thought, well, if I could, if I could find, if I could do 100,000 and I could find 220 other individuals like me, and by the way, there's not 220 individuals like me out there. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but there were, there were about 20 or 30 who did 100,000 with me. And, and, but then we had football teams doing like as many burpees as they could in three hours. We had people doing 24 hours of burpees. We had all sorts of permutations. And we ended up doing 22 million burpees. And we raised $300,000 for veterans. And, uh, and we en- ended up putting um, a number of them through a year-long post-traumatic growth uh, plan that, that really had almost 100% success in healing them, getting them back on track. Wow. Very inspiring. So we're going to take another whack at that program this year, but we're going to flip the, the script, like I told you earlier, before we started the show. We're, instead of just a small number of people doing a massive number of burpees, we're going to try to get a massive number of people to do a small number of burpees through kind of a viral social media challenge. Well, Burpees I'm excited. Burpeesforvets.com if you're interested. Join us. Burpeesforvets.com. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Be awesome. I'm in. I'm in. The, uh, I didn't do, like, the ice bucket challenge was one thing, but, you know, like, okay. But burpees, that's a whole other thing. I could use some burpees. I've just been lately in a bit of a, a just a cardio kind of, like, all my workouts are cardio. And last night I, I came back from my office and I, I, Mark, I said, this is raw and real entrepreneurship. So I was tired. We were like getting this, um, piece of equipment. Um, we, it, you know, in our, in radius, we have, you know, different, um, things we do with computer vision. So we're taking this piece of equipment apart and we're putting it back together. We're doing these different things. I'm looking at legal documents and, you know, all this stuff. And I come in the house and, um, I'm tired. And I said to my husband, I'm like, I should get on the Peloton, but I want a glass of wine. And he's like, get on the Peloton. And so we were happy. This big storm was rolling in and I was like, we're going to lose power. So I was like, I'm going to do a weight workout instead. And I was like, I haven't done weights in a while. So I'm excited for the burpee challenge because it's everything. It's cardio resistance training, and your arms are going to look legit with a lot of burpees. The other thing that's great about burpees (laughs) is wherever you go there, they, there, there they are, right? You, you can't not bring the equipment with you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Wherever you go, there they are. I'm going to quote you on that one. Um, the, you know, you were talking about the, the post-traumatic stress disorder that happens with vets. And it's interesting now we're seeing um, a lot of people saying they have, they're using the, the phrase PTSD just very like, oh, I went on Instagram and I have PTSD or I had a fight with my boss and I had PTSD. Can you talk about the difference between true PSD and I just had a bad day? Sure. Um, I see that too. And I think what they're really talking about is burnout, right? Which is yeah. a little bit different because there is a lot of burnout going on. People are, are burned out from the negativity and the anxiety and the, um, you know, just being locked down or being on Zoom all day long, it's uncomfortable. And they don't yeah. have the strategies and the tools to maintain balance and a positive mindset through these challenging times. So that leads to a buildup of stress, which then leads to this slow degradation of your energy, which then chips away your, your positivity, which then chips away your optimism. And then you think, oh, this sucks. You know, everything's lost. Everything's going to shit. Yeah. And then you get burned out, right? So that's the problem. But that's a little bit different than post-traumatic stress. So post-traumatic stress is, it, there's, there's chronic and then there's acute, right? And bo- they kind of work together for vets. So the chronic stress is, you know, I, I'm, I'm training for war and um, I've got this extremely high risk job where literally in training, I have more SEAL buddies of mine who were killed in training than in combat. It's like, it, it's game on every day. And, and I came close to death multiple times. I uh, feel very blessed to be here. 
And so there's parts of it are survivor guilt, right? So when you see a friend pass away in front of you, I remember my, my second parachute jump, you know, here comes another plane over for, it was a British SBS and they were had just flown in from Dover and out in Arizona and they drop and this guy had a streamer. He burns in and we had two more jumps and we're thinking, there's no way we're going up in that plane. And the instructors come over and they look at us and jock up, get back in the plane. They knew that if we didn't get right back on it, then we would suffer from post-traumatic stress because we would allow that fear of that environment of that, that incident to really just seep into us. And we had to get through that really quickly and realize that that, you know, that was just an incident that happened. It's not going to be us, but that happens again and again and again in different scenarios. Right. And so that starts to really, really chip away out of that because those traumatic incidents just begin to imprint and imprint and imprint. Right. And then you have combat itself. Right. So now this takes everything up by 200 to 300 percent, right? Because now people are actually shooting at you and trying to kill you. They're shooting your friends and killing your friends. You know, you're getting near misses, or you may have actual uh, IEDs or explosions. You know, that go and that rattle you. And so, part of post-traumatic stress is actually physical trauma to the brain, and that could be mm-hmm. micro or macro trauma. Micro would be like just I'm at the gun range and I'm, you know, for month after month I'm just shooting thousands and thousands of rounds, and you know they now know that that has an effect on your brain. Or, of course, like I said, the big explosion goes off and boom, you get rattled. So all this combined with the guilt of seeing your friends die, but you survive. It's all. Let me say it this way. It, it builds up. And if left unretreated or unresolved, it will come out someday in a negative way. Right. It's going to it's going to cause um, severe imbalances physiologically and psychologically that then show up with these vets who are like suicidal or just completely messed up. We know that there are ways to help vets both what I call pre-resiliency. And this is what I I was trying to do through SealFit or what I do through SealFit is to give them strategies to manage the stress before and during these incredibly intense experiences, things such as breath control, um, attention control, uh, being able to remain hooked to a real strong why. Like, so one of the problems that vets have when they transition out that cause, you know, that ex- exacerbates the situation is that they went from an environment where they had a strong sense of purpose and mission and a team around them to all of a sudden they're out and they're like staring at a blank wall every day and trying to get a job and they're lost and confused and they don't have a team anymore. So they lost their purpose, they lost their mission and they lost their team. So that, you know, they need to figure out how to get back there real quick. So we can help them with that going in, but then we can also help people help the vets as they transition out of the military, you know, before they start to go into that abyss, right? We, we catch them as they transition and then give them these tools or reinforce them if they had them, help them find a new purpose and mission and vision and plug them into a team. And that has, that's called post-traumatic growth, which is the antidote to post-traumatic stress. But you know, everything I just talked about applies to people who are really suffering from an acute issue like loss of a loved one during COVID-19, right? Which is mm-hmm. different than the burnout issue, right? So if you lost loved ones or your business imploded and, you know, suddenly you're homeless, <laughs> yeah. sleeping on your, your sister's <laughs> couch or your parents' couch, like I think you might've done in your life. Those things can also lead to the, you know, maybe not as severe as the vet who's been to combat, but certainly uh, traumatic uh, experiences. And so there are, there are ways to get through it. And most of them, most of the ways that, that um, the pharmacological and and government wants you to do are not the right ways. Right. So the, what does work is somatic work like yoga, massage uh, combined with therapy. Um, Psychedelics are showing to have a profound effect for healing. Uh, cybacillin, ketamine, uh, ibogaine in particular. Mm-hmm. And um, the practices that you know, come from the East, breath control, visualization, mindfulness. And then of course, the um, what I mentioned earlier, having a support group, a team, and then learning how to identify the next mission in your life. Mm. Just think about that. All of those are relevant for anybody. Who just yeah. lost their job or just lost their business, right? 
or just lost a loved one. It's like all those skills are like, oh yeah, I could use some help finding a new, my purpose. What is my purpose for the next phase of my life? I don't want to keep doing what I've been doing. I'm not inspired or that was a negative environment or, you know, and so what is my mission and who's my team? And then, you know, what are the stress management skills that are going to get my body, mind and, and attitude and energy, like really, really tuned back up so that I can go forward and just crush it. The, That's what you, I like to teach people, by the way. You, you said so much there, Mark, and, and to your point, it's, it's relevant to the person who lost their restaurant in COVID or right. that, you know, lost to your point, a loved one, or is just, you know, whatever is going on for them, a cancer diagnosis or whatever. And I, I think, um, you know, one of my places where my, my heart is, and I've thought about this a lot is what can we take from military training and create a step-by-step -step system for vets to start a business? Because mm -hmm. I have many friends wow. who served in the military and they're, they are there right now, like just to be raw and real, they want to leave right now. They're mm -hmm. frustrated, mm -hmm. but they, you know, I've, you know, I've trained and been programmed to be a soldier. And so what now, right? Like what now for me? And I don't necessarily fit into another environment. Right. And so that's it. And there, there are some great opportunities out there. And sometimes part of the healing <clears throat> is the, the, the aspect of the healing is really to maybe do some things that might be, you know, a little bit removed from, you know, being around so many people as part of that transition. And I know that you and I spoke before the show and I was sharing, um, that I had been a, a men's maximum security prison guard. And there are things I'm, that I experienced that I'm not allowed to talk about um, because probably men in suits will come arrest me, but there, there are different things. Or even being a 21-year-old girl and reading case files from the, um, the serial killers in Canada, Carla Hamulka and Paul Bernardo, and, and, and seeing photos and graphic detail of what they did to the 14 year old girls that they killed and, and thinking about that and that stuff, that trauma that can either deflate us or it can refine us. And, and one of the things I've always said is, you know, in the face of challenge, we can give up or get better. And we can choose to allow something to define us or refine us. And one of many things I love about your work, and even before the show is writing down Mark Divine quotes, is that this is, you're this, this, this beacon of light who's out there, who is saying there is post-traumatic growth. You don't have to dwell here. It's not like you have to build your house in the trauma. It just pitch your tent and there is a path out of there. Let me ask you this. And one of the things, um, I have a friend who is a very high ranking, um, SAS, uh, Colonel and, um, one of the, over much wine, um, I had asked him, I had said, you know, when, you know, you're in Iraq and there's an IED or whatever, and then your, your Jeep flips, what is the first thing you do? And my question for you is you work with a lot of entrepreneurs. So let's say someone's listening and or watching and they mark are like trauma just hit and it's like out of nowhere. I wasn't expecting it. So what, what can you take from, you know, your experience in the seals and advice to translate into them in terms of some steps they could take? Yeah, that's such a great question there's a couple of ways we can look at it. One is like a little bit longer term and one is the immediate now, right? Yeah. Let's start so, with immediate now and then longer now, term. Yeah. You know, the, the mortar comes in and explodes. And so you think you're under attack. And so for COVID, it could be like the announcement for the economic shutdown, right? And, and you're going to quarantine or something like that. Whatever happened in March of 2020 that we're all going like, what the bleep is going on here? Yeah. So that's the mortar, right? Most people will do one of two things. They'll either freeze and do nothing. And that's problematic because when you freeze, you know, you literally shut down your ability to take in information. You're, you're really not um, able to 
you know, we, we, I'd much rather have you like send little probes out to figure out what's going on. You know what I mean? Where get some information feedback loops starting to flow, but freezing is, is the worst thing to do. And close to freezing as the worst thing to do is to just immediately react. And so a lot of people just immediately react and yet they, they, the reaction might take them in a completely different direction. It might take them toward the ambush instead of away mm. from it. So we have an acronym in the SEALs, PBTA. We say, when the crisis hits, pause. Just that act of pausing and doing nothing, even if it's just for a second, it intercepts your, the amygdala where the amygdala you know, is receiving this crisis information and it's immediately sending you into fight or flight because it's, it's saying that's bad. The body mind has to react this way. It's triggering the sympathetic nervous system, which is sending all those hormones, adrenaline, epinephrine, everything that's just, just narrows your focus and sends you into this like reactionary mode and you just have to act. So you pause and you intercept that. Then you breathe. And this might be as simple as five deep breaths or, you know, if, it's, if you have more time, it could mean like breathe into this for a few days as a team. Let's just breathe. Let's not do anything reactionary. Let's not freeze up either. We're going to get a plan together, but let's just calm ourselves down, right? Let's not freak out. And so the breathing, of course, is it's metaphorical, but it's actual skill. We close our mouths and we breathe through our nostrils. And that is, you know, skill. One of basic training for breath control is always be breathing through your nostrils, unless you're in the middle of a really hard workout or you're talking like I am right now. <laughs> so nostril breathing does a lot for us. It slows the breathing down. It releases nitrous oxide, which helps get the oxygen delivered to your cells. So you have more energy. Hmm. It stimulates the mind because the breath goes up and stimulates the, the nadis or the energy channels that are, um, you know, that kind of go behind the optical nerves and then spiral down the spine. It slows your breathing down to an ideal six breaths per minute rate. So you want to breathe like in a five count in, five count out pattern through your nose. And this has enormous benefits. Now, what you're doing is you're using your diaphragm. You're getting more oxygen in, which is energizing you, which is going to stimulate your brain. So you're going to be thinking better. It's calming your nervous system down because your vagus nerve is being massaged, which stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, which counteracts that signal for flight and flight. And all of this has the effect of slowing down your mind so your thoughts aren't racing. You don't have that like, I can't, I can't get a radar lock on where to go, what to do. Slows all that down. So this can happen, like I said, in a minute or two or even over the course of a day if there's a big like bomb that's dropped in your business. Just breathe into it and calm everything down. That, that opens up the space for the third letter in the acronym PBTA, which is let's think. Now, there are strategies for thinking, of course. So we always, you know, we have some strategies for thinking, right? And one of them is to assess what is the, um, what is the most important thing right now that you can do that's going to get you away from danger and into safety, mm. right? We get off the X and we move to safe ground. It may not be where you ultimately want to be. You're not going to save your business with one decision, but what can you do to get out of the danger zone and move to safe ground? And then how can you break that down into the, the smallest actionable chunk and do that right now? So we have a saying that doubt is eliminated through action because you take that small step and you, and you have a win that gives you a little bit more confidence, but it also brings in information and that information you need information. So so that uncertainty and doubt starts to be eliminated as you take these little tiny micro actions, you know, that are chunked down. And in that way, you might say, well, I, I think I want to go there, but I'm just going to focus on this part, get information in this part. And by the time you get to step three, you realize that that was actually the wrong target and you need to go over there instead. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't invest heavily in that target. It's kind of like the idea of, you know, let's get the minimum viable, tar minimum viable product out for radius II. AI, and then let's iterate from there because where you thought you were going to go may end up in a different direction when you take those micro steps. And then that fourth is act, right? You can't just pause, breathe, think, pause, breathe, think, pause, breathe, think. You have to actually take action. 
And that action has to be um, bold and decisive because once you choose, just do it and let the repercussions fall where they may, but don't waver, right? Don't hem and haw and don't second guess. Hmm. Fortune favors the bold. That was your yeah. SAS friends saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. I, you know, I, I love that. And obviously I was taking some notes, the PBTA, the failure rate, for entrepreneurs is, as you know, it's 50%. Mm -hmm. The number one reason 83% of businesses fail because of cash flow. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you about that whole concept of fortune favors the bold, because the way I see it, there are people out there who jump in as entrepreneurs and they don't know what the heck they're doing. Mm -hmm. Right. True. And then there are people who are on the other end of the spectrum. They overthink it. How does someone find that happy medium? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> overthinking things was okay. 20 years ago. Oh, in a much slower, more linear period of time. And so that's why you have, you know, five-year strategic plans, but five-year strategic plan today is useless you know, you might have a quarterly plan that could be mostly effective, but um, things are changing so fast that, and everything's being disrupted so fast that we really need to come up with um, what we used to do in the seals was we call rapid planning. And we, we, we had an idea of where we wanted to go, but we didn't have a perfect plan, nor did we try to have a perfect plan for how to get there. We let the um, momentum of the mission help us determine where to go each step and how to get there. And we had contingency plans for when things, we expected things to not go according to plan. So we had plan B, plan C, and then we had a plan to make up plan D if necessary, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we would plan really fast. So a typical military mission, you know, would take 72 hours or if it's a major campaign, you know, weeks or months to plan, you know, Navy SEALs, we would hit a target we would find information on that target that would suggest that there was another target somewhere else. And we would pull out the little notebook or a napkin and make a plan in 20 minutes or half an hour and we'd go execute. The reason we were able to do that is because of the relentlessness of our training around standard operating procedures. So anything that could be turned into a process, we would do it and we would drill it so that we'd have to plan that stuff, right? We weren't planning anything to do with like, who's going to drive the car and what seat you're, you know, like if you look at an army plan for something, like they have all these little details and like, we just do it. This is why I love that. I was talking to a seal friend and he said this big difference between, and this is, and let's relate this to business afterwards. But so he's a, a tier one operator, you know, the equivalent of SAS in America is uh, Delta force or CAG or seal team six or dev group. They have two names for things because they, they think they're being sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> Silly. <laughs> so let's just call it SEAL Team 6. So the SEAL Team 6 commander is they're on a joint mission with the Rangers and he's there, you know, completely silent watching his guys operate. And the Ranger over here is saying, okay, now at the house next above, you're going to turn left, right? And then you're going to go right. And you know, I've got your overwatch over here and you know, blah, blah, blah. Like he's directing things and he thinks that's what he was taught. He thinks that's the way things are done. And he looks over at the SEAL. He's like, why aren't you leading your troops? And the SEAL says, I am, but I'm not going to get in their way right now because this is exactly what they're trained for. And if I say one word, it's just going to slow them down and they'll call for my help when they need it. Mm. Isn't that interesting? So we need to train entrepreneurs and leaders now to like unleash the fury of intelligence and creativity of their, of their troops and, and systematize what needs to be systematized, but let their creative juices just explode and not get in their way. And my book, um, Staring Down the Wolf, which came out last year, the week before the pandemic, mind you. So we sold so many pre-copies thinking, yeah, this is a shoe in to be on the New York Times bestseller list. Nope. Right. The, the Democratic primary was that week and then the pandemic hit and like, <laughs> chirp, chirp. I'm like, okay, bad timing. So Staring Down the Wolf is all about how leaders are often the inhibiting factor in their team success. So uh, why do a lot of entrepreneurs fail is because they don't, they, they try to micromanage everything. They don't trust their teams sometimes, you know, and, and so they come up having to have all the answers and try to be perfect. And their conversation often shuts down 
creativity because, you know, they always have to have the last word. They won't give credit where credit's due. There's all these kind of character defects that just don't fly in today's world, especially with Gen Z and millennials. They're like, no, you know, <laughs> a third, you know, authoritarian or autocratic type leadership, or, you know, you being the jerk in the crowd, if you're the owner or entrepreneur, it, it doesn't fly anymore. You know, people aren't, you know, people aren't ex accepting that and they just leave or shut mm. them down and they'll just go through the motions, to collect a paycheck, but you're not going to get the results you want. You, you, you mentioned cash flow. You know, I think you know, there's, yeah, I used to call it like there's visionary businesses and then there's like traditional businesses like go get VC or, or, you know, SBA loan and then pour money into it and hope it works. Like when I started the, the Cornetta Brewing Company, it was a visionary business. I was like, I'm going to figure out how to make cash flow and I'm going to get the cash flow positive as fast as I can. And then I figure out how to scale it from there. And it worked. And the business is really successful today, although I'm, com I'm completely out of it. And I did the same thing with my second business. And then, you know, I've gotten to a point now where I'm willing to take on capital and we're about ready to kind of do that whole thing, you know, re-engineer for the next phase of growth. But that mindset is, to, is very adaptable, you know, very uh, willing to change and actually uh, wanting to change, you know, knowing that you need to be adaptive and e evolutionary as a company, but also as a team, right? I don't want to- It's like the time. Dalai Lama of um, business, seriously. So you're, it's like, <sighs> okay, yeah. <laughs> it makes so much sense, doesn't it? Like it we does. Are, we, can't, does. You know, we can't use the same strategy and tactics as got us where we are because obviously they're not working. And most businesses that can't disrupt themselves with their own ingenuity are going to get disrupted by somebody else. And yeah. it all comes down to people and people all comes down to mindset and how we learn to deal with stress and how we learn to think and how we learn to cooperate as a team. Yeah. We say in my training that every, every individual and every team is capable of 20 times more than they think they are. Mm -hmm. but you know, how do you unlock that genius? You know, you have to really, you know, the ideas of psychological safety and Brene Brown's vulnerability and this notion that the team is the new leader is what I'm playing with. It's like, there's no one individual that has the answers anymore. You got to have the, the synergistic creative, you know, spontaneity of a team that's firing all cylinders and trust and respects each other and is able to be courageous with their decision-making. The team is the new leader. That's huge. And, you know, as you were talking and um, you were talking about bringing on um, venture capital. So I'd, the business that collapsed that I had in um, that collapsed in 2000, I had a little bit of um, business loans to start that. I bootstrapped the rest. And I took on some loans. And then when that one failed, I said, never again, you know, and then it's like never again. And so I bootstrapped all my other businesses. And then with Radius, it was a traditional like, yes, we're going to bring in friends and family around. And it's a different, I thank God every day, Mark, that I was a professional athlete because when you're bringing millions of dollars of friends and family money to start a business and they're texting you going, what's going on? You know? And, and I, I, I had to, there were so many times where I had to, no matter how I was feeling, I, I had to think about them first and not me. It's like, I have other people's money and the, the advice I would give. And when startups come to me because they're like, oh, Susan, you know how to raise money. Yeah, I do. But when they come to me, I'm like my, one of my first questions is, you know, what is your, commitment level because you're you now have other people's money and that's a whole yeah, different story yeah mm -hmm. i've avoided that because what the brewing company coronado brewing company was my first business i had four, you know not a ton but 45 shareholders family friends and fools and so then we had a board of directors and so i was always reporting to the board and always dealing exactly what you're talking about always having to communicate with the shareholders it took probably 40 percent of my time i'm just guessing but it was a lot and then, so my businesses that I've grown similar to you in the other direction was, I don't want to do that. So I don't have a board. I don't have any investors. I own hundred percent, but there's limitations there, right? I mean, mm -hmm. unless you have a unicorn that is just scale, you know, it's like I could move a lot faster and serve a lot more people, right? If I had capital 
to hire more all stars and to be able to invest in sales and marketing and, and whatnot. So I'm like, okay, I get that. Now the question is, what's the right type of financial partner and what's the right mechanism, right? And so I'm, I yes. love this idea. There's two ideas that I love with regards to funding and I'm going to pursue. One is crowdsource funding. Yep. I just had a friend who raised $10 million through a crowd fund. It was a huge, huge success. Brian Johnson runs a company called Optimize. Oh, and as an aside, the and mm. which crowdfunding platform? So yeah. um, WeFunder is one I'm very familiar with because a yeah. board I sit on, we're um, taking them Brian through used. WeFunder. Mm. Yeah, I love, and I've met with the principals and it's such a great company. So a sidebar. <laughs> yeah, totally. So yeah. We've, let's just, WeFunder does it great and they're a public benefit corporation. They really care about the environment. They care about their employees and they want to work with businesses like that. So that's the new, that ties into the second kind of piece. But first, what's cool about the crowdfund campaign is let's say, you know, all, you're raising money and you got family, friends and people who want to participate. You say, great, you go through the crowdfund campaign and then all that gets rolled up and you have one point of contact. You have one light item in your cap table, not 50 or hundred, one light item. There's one investor representative for that whole crowdfund group. That's one thing that's really beneficial. So then they become the conduit information to your family and friends. And anytime they send you a text, you say, well, you know, just go check out the portal and, and there's all the information there, you know, the quarterly results, blah, blah, blah. And then second thing is you tend to attract the, this insanely passionate community of people who are using your products, who are evangelizing your products. And you even find capital, uh, other capital sources like, like uh, hedge funds who really are interested in your space through that crowdfund. Which brings me to point two is there are kind of a new breed of, of um, I, I don't know if they're called hedge funds, but a new breed of capital providers who really are passionate about purpose first. And, yeah. and having this multi-stakeholder, they insist on having a multi-stakeholder approach to business good for the employees, good for the clients, good for the communities, good for the investors, good for the overall environment, and then the global commons. Like, boom, that's a, that's a quadruple or quintuple bottom line stakeholder approach. So those types, like I have a, a friend who just invested in his business and they've got an incredible product. It's called Mudwater, right? It's like an alternative to coffee made out of six different types of mushrooms. And Shane Heath is the founder and I've been working with him and um, they have a financial partner. They just raised money. They're like 130 million valuation now. They raised money from their first investor was one of these socially conscious um, hedge funds. And they insisted that everyone on the team do certain health, mental health practices as part of their investment, right? They insisted they go on quarterly retreats. They insisted that they bring in uh, a wellness program that included yoga and mindfulness. Like that was really cool to hear. I'm like that. So, so even the world of finance for entrepreneurs is changing dramatically. And the old, you know, paradigm of VCs as vultures, it still exists. Be very careful. You know, I experienced that myself, but there's a new paradigm creeping up. So uh, crowdfunding and, and finding a, a purpose driven funder, are, I think really interesting to explore. I had Mike McDermott on the show and he was the co-founder of FreshBooks, which now has a billion dollar valuation. He had um, stepped down as um, CEO and he's chair. And we had, it was a fun, we had a, a fun banter because I said, when startups come to me, I always ask them, what is your exit plan? And he said, you shouldn't think about the exit plan. I, I, I said, I respectfully disagree because if you are bringing on funding, you should know your exit plan. Every VC is going to ask you, every investor is going to ask you, and you have to be clear. And to your point, Mark, if you set up your company, if you're a US company and you set it up as a C Corp and you have an ESOP, there are many ways you can exit. You can sell your shares back to the ESOP. I have had friends that have done that. One of my friends had a, a marketing agency. He 
exited with millions of dollars. Um, and it's tax free to do it in many States. I have other friends who exited their ESOP with, you know, multiple seven figures and they are, you know, taking the money out. And then the employees like Southwest become owners in the company. Mm. And to your point, the team leading the leader that now they have that vested interest. So I'm a big believer yeah. in hybrid fundraising. And yeah. that's, you know, when, when start, when, you know, right now, you know, if someone's like, oh, will you be on my board or will you help me fundraise or whatever? I, I put them through maybe not Navy SEAL style training, but a lot of rigorous mental gymnastics and forcing them to think about things they might not be thinking about. And, um, and I think that, you know, that's a whole other conversation. Oh my gosh. Let, okay. Final question for you. We were talking about this before, uh, we went into recording and I'm like, oh my gosh, we should be recording this. I would love to get your perspective on what's going on in the world right now and where things are going. And most importantly for entrepreneurs, where you think the, the opportunities are. Oh man. So I have a, a very um, kind of meta perspective and it's, it's really grounded in my spiritual practice, right? I guess mm -hmm. I'll say not religious, by the way, I don't, I don't really subscribe to any religion per se, even though I was brought up as a Christian. So I believe that the, basically as human beings, we are vibrational energy, right? We're, we're photonic vibrational energy. And that the darkest form of energy, you know, run, um, that exists leads to fear and um, violence. And the highest vibrational energy that exists leads to compassion and peace and inclusiveness or connection, lack of separation. And so everyone happens to have their little vibrational signature and it can evolve. It can evolve through your own efforts. So we call that growth. It can evolve through um, a crisis and then you're coming out of the other side and saying, no more, I'm, I'm changing. And so then suddenly your vibration, your, th your thinking change, your vibration change, your body actually will change. So this is playing out at a, at a, a massive level across the globe. And it started with, you know, the internet was part of it, you know, the, the ability to connect everybody and then mobile devices. And then of course the internet of things and, and, and the cloud and now 5g and now, of course, Starlink and, you know, Google balloons. And so within a few years, you'll have everybody, almost everybody on the planet connected with a mobile device. So information is ubiquitous. Now, information itself is just information, but there's negative information. And that's the mass media trying to control everyone so that they can consume their products or yes. vote for their, you know, um, preferred, you know, candidate or politician. And then there's information like you and I are sharing, which is you know, positive, it's uplifting, it's leading to a higher vibrational level. And so what's happening is, is we're reaching tipping points where more and more people are accessing positive information, it's resonating with them, they're committing to growth, they're committing to thinking positively, they're committing to having a positive view of the future as opposed to a dystopian one. And this is one of my mission is to, to is to lead 100 million people to transformation into this kind of compassionate, positive mm -hmm. and inclusive leadership. And so th then you imagine 100 million people vibrating at that level, uh, impacting 10 people each. Now we got a billion people who are thinking this way. The counter effect of this, and this is happening really fast. It's happening in the next 20 to 30 years. The counter effect of this is is going to just e obliterate a lot of this violence and negativity that we see in the world, which is a vestige of the last 100, 200, 500, even 1,000 years of negative thinking. Yeah. And so that's like my meta view. I have an extremely positive view of the future. I think that a, you know, a billion people thinking of you know, Mother Earth as a necessary partner in our life will heal Mother Earth. It's not going to be carbon capture, you know what I mean, or carbon credits from the United Nation. It's going to be a billion people putting their hands on the earth and healing the earth and healing the ocean or 2 billion or 4 billion, right? It's going to be, it's like, let me say it this way. Gandhi said, be the change you need to see in the world. He's talking about an individual. I'm talking about that at scale. I want to, I want to have a hundred million or a billion people be the change that they want to see in the world. So we can now scale the evolution of consciousness to a more positive vibration 
It's the first time ever in human history. So that's extraordinary. And all these technologies, like what you're working on and others, they all have a positive application and a negative application. The negative application is inevitable because there will always be people, you know, who are greedy and egocentric and, you know, vibrating at that negative victim and violent level. But the positive energy is, is so much more powerful that it'll keep that in check and it'll just keep on diminishing and diminishing it and diminishing it. And then the sheepdog of the world, yours and my friends will, will um, be able to take out most of that negativity. Now, the, the big risk in this vision is what happens to the nuclear weapons and how, you know, how fast does this happen? You know, because global warming seems to be speeding up. Well, I'm not as worried about global warming as I am about, you know, just some wackos, you know, going off with nuclear weapons. So we, we, you know, we really need to be thoughtful about how as a global community, we hold our warlord leaders accountable. Mm -hmm. And the, the, uh, there's to, so to reduce the risk of some accident, right? Or some yeah. And, and, injury. and not all warlords appear as warlords, like the wolf in sheep's clothing, no, I'm right? Saying and even, <laughs> even, you know, uh, even our major um, nation states, I consider warlords. Mm -hmm. If you're arming yourself, then you're attacking yourself. You're just, and, and you're waiting to be attacked. Basically, this is a yeah. spiritual principle, like straight out of the course of miracles. If you're yeah. defending yourself with weapons and nuclear weapons, you are attacking yourself. It's just a matter of time before you get attacked by somebody yeah. else because you're already attacking yourself. Because you're vibrating that. So we could have a whole other conversation. So I was yeah. trained in um, calibrated consciousness by Dr. David Hawkins himself before oh, he died. Uh, doc Dr. Hawkins is one of my heroes. And uh, he was a lovely man. And uh, then Wayne Dyer was a good friend of mine. No kidding. Oh and, uh, and so Wayne, the, the whole thing, and now people are like, yeah. Mark and Susan have got a woohoo. We've like, done woo-woo, but not at all. David no. Hawkins is probably the most under, has had one of the most profound impacts, but nobody knows about him because they, they don't really understand his contribution. But the ability to calibrate consciousness and his skill of zero to a thousand which is what I was talking to. So you must've been going like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's a profound contribution to humanity because like with that technology, we could literally calibrate level consciousness of a world leader and say, yeah, no, yeah, you're exactly. vibrating below, below 400. So go away, wait until you come, you know, or 200 as the line of integrity. Right. right. So, you know, and, and one of the things Dr. Hawkins you know, in, in his training is understanding that when you have a leader or you have a country that is below the line of integrity, right. it doesn't matter how much money you pour in there. And I could talk about different specific countries and I won't, that money is always going to be used for those low conscious things that have to do with greed and um, deception and, you know, all sorts of horrific things that happen. And people are like, well, can't we just keep throwing money to the problem? No. Um, you know, I, I, I've traveled in fire. like 34, 35 countries in the world. And I've seen some, you know, I used to go, Mark, you don't know this, but I used to go undercover in brothels to do recon for IJM right in Cambodia, in Phnom Penh, before they even had traffic lights there. Like I was like crazy. I'm still crazy, but you know, anyway, but yes, you, you know, and people would say, well, how can you do that? And, or how can people do that? How can they traffic children? It's their level of consciousness. And until we all not, we don't all have to, but you know, um, a high tide raises all ships, right. so to speak. So until the conscious entrepreneurs come together and create conscious businesses and mm -hmm. rally together and stand together, much like in SEAL training that, you know, to your point, the PBTA, like we're going to come together, we're going to pause, we're going to think about this, we're going to breathe, and then we're going to act, right? Until we all come together and begin to do that, that's change at the level that it must happen to match the level of the way things are going right. is not going to happen. So, oh my gosh, Mark. Okay. We're, agree. we're best change, friends now. Change can <laughs> happen at scale through organizations and it can happen very rapidly when you're around every day around people who are really committed to that level of growth and, and that level of um, interconnected or integration yeah. at a global level. Right. So it doesn't mean that you have to, take a, a, a haircut on profits or, you know, it doesn't mean you can't be wealthy. No, no, you can, 
but we're going to be good and do good simultaneously and not for just ourselves, but for our communities and the global commons. Right. And so we got to think of ourselves with this conversation, a great place to kind of pin is like, we got to think of ourselves as global citizens first and still love our countries and still love our communities. Right. But, you know, we hurt anything. We're hurting everything. Mm. That's the consciousness level. So we raise that level where we recognize that our actions, our thoughts impact the world. Our actions impact them even more, our words even more. And so let's elevate our thoughts, words, and actions to a high vibrational level. And that feels like and looks like more peaceful, more compassionate, more connecting, more inclusive, less violence, less judgment, less projection. And um, no, wow, things can change really fast with that. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is a good place to pin this because there's like, you know, hopefully, and every, if you are listening to the show, um, go ahead, you know, Mark and I would love a five-star review because we're leaders. We'll ask for what we want. If you are on YouTube, drop a comment below. I'm the one who it's not my staff. YouTube is my happy place. So I'm the one responding to your comments. So Mark and I would love to hear from you. And if you go to, um, markdevine.com, there is a, and I wrote, I have so many notes. It's not even unbeatable, funny. Unbeatablemind.com. Unbeatablemind.com. Yes. Forward slash challenge. It's you could go to markdivine.com too, but go to unbeatablemind.com forward slash challenge. Go to both if you want. <laughs> awesome. It's been so much fun, Susan. What well, Mark, day. thank you so much. Thanks for everything you're doing in the world. And uh, I hope everyone's going to join in in the burpee challenge. Um, yeah, my arms are ready for that. So with that, everyone, uh, this has been another episode of Raw and Real Entrepreneurship. Thanks so much for being here. I'd love for you to share the show. And I will see you in the next episode.